Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good to see everyone. On a balmy January Sunday morning. Um, anyone have any prayer requests or testimonies they want to share this morning? My, I, okay. It's yeah. Small. Well, it's kind of a big deal for me, but my heat works in my truck again. Praise the Lord. Apparently, it was nothing to do with the motor, and it was nothing to do with the doohickey other thing. Apparently, it was a hidden fuse that had blown that wasn't even in the book. Like, it wasn't in the owner's manual. wasn't in anything. And uh, after Eric ripped apart my whole dashboard, he found it and replaced it. Praise the Lord. Yeah. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Michael got the victory over a snowblower that didn't want to start when it was cold yesterday. <laughs> so good job to start when there's no snow to blow, but we'll take the victory whenever we can get it. <laughs> Anyone else this morning? Anyone else prayer request testimonies? All right. Um, so I'll just share a little bit. Um, so I told you guys a couple weeks ago that when you serve the Lord, you just never know, right? You just never know what's going to happen. The Lord brings things into your life, people into your life that you didn't even know you were missing, right? So I'm adopted, um, and my birth father connected with me on Facebook, um, I don't know, a couple weeks ago. And guess who came over for dinner last night? <laughs> my birth father, his name is Neil, <laughs> um, and uh, a niece um, named... Uh, I just forgot her name. Uh, Katie came over and we had four hours together. There were tears and there were um, just, you know, catching up and people that kind of have drifted apart. And, um, you know, it's funny that I, you know, God blesses us with things we don't even ask for. Like I didn't, didn't know I was missing something until God, God gives us a gift. And relationships and family are a gift no matter what form they come in. And, you know, human relationships can be complicated. My life is a perfect example. <laughs> my mom is my sister, my birth father is a stranger, and my grandparents are my parents. Like, I could just, it, it's confusing even for me, and I've lived it. Um, but relationships are important, and the people that are in our lives are there for a reason. And um, I posted a TED Talk on Facebook the other day. It really shocked me. This woman talked about how these people did a study of middle-aged people, and they tracked them for 70 years to see what were the factors that led to longevity in life. What were the factors, what were the most things they had in common for people that lived the longest? The bottom of the list, thank goodness, was weight, <laughs> exercise. The top of the list, relationships. Are you surrounded by people that you can call on when life turns crazy and turns difficult? Number one on the list, connectivity, right? How connected, and I just, I couldn't help but think that as Christians, we're called to pour out. That's really all it is. Being connected is pouring out of yourself. Because a, a, a lake stopped up, or a pond stopped up, dies. And when we pour out, and we pour out life, and we pour out salt and light into this world, we're blessed as a result of it. And I just found that really interesting that that is the things that lead to longest life. Yeah. Being in relationships with people, loving people and being loved in return, and being connected and being kind and being that light in this world leads to long life. Not a shock to us, I don't think, but for the secular world, it was an epiphany that all those exercise and all those diets are at the bottom of the list. And being kind and being full of life and love is at the top of the list. So anyway, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. So anyone, anyone, last, last call this morning, everyone, yeah, James. James. Alright, anyone else this morning? Yeah, uh, I just want to praise God for how good he is. Um, you know, I've been reading, I've been, I've been doing this uh, daily Bible plan to read the Bible in one year. And, you know, the wisdom that, that continues to be revealed, it's, it's so amazing uh, to me. And, and I'm so thankful not only for that, but also for him giving me uh, a wife that uh, gets better than I could have 
task for. Um, it, it amazes me every day how my relationship with Kelly is because uh, this, this is a true partnership. And, and every day I find something new that I like about her and, and being able to actually talk to someone and, and be open about uh, things that before you were somewhat ashamed and not necessarily bad things, but uh, I told her something the other day and, and I said, you know, with you, uh, I don't have a problem telling you if, if I'm afraid about something because I know you're not going to judge me. I'm very thankful for, for that. Uh, and I just want to thank the Lord and praise Him for, for being so good to me and, and all He's done in my life. Praise God. Amen. All right. Thank you, Lord, that you're faithful. Thank you, Jesus. 
Thank you, Lord, that you're here everyone else this morning. All right. Let's stand and go to the Lord. Oh, Jesus. We're so thankful, Lord. So thankful, Lord, that you're faithful, Lord. No matter what the need, Lord, no matter what the situation, Lord, that you know, Lord, that you're faithful, Lord. Thank you, 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 Lord. Thank
right after service, we'll meet for like three minutes. Uh, we're going to go over floor plan, strategy, meeting places, um, just to coordinate all who's going so we can somehow find a way to have seats together. Um, can I have a hand, hand, handful of hands? Who's, who's going? I just need to know how many copies I need to make. Okay, all right. I'll make uh, some copies of this downstairs. We'll have a strategy. Like I said, well, I'm going to take about three, five minutes after church today to get her done, get her nailed down, and, and uh, we'll go from there. All right, praise the Lord. Amen. All right, uh, let's see. Toby and John, would you two like to come take an offering this morning? Toby, you want to ask a blessing, please? Lord, thank you for being here today, God. Join with your people, God, that you can praise the Lord. Each and every day, Lord, we find new depth of your love, your kindness, and your mercy, God. Your word, Lord, we count as our every being, God. We believe it each and every day. We put our trust in it. It is faithful and true, God. It resonates as a life, Lord God. We live it and breathe it, Lord. We declare your word as our truth, Lord, and our guidance through life. Now, Lord, we just ask that you will bless this offering, God. Bless the gift and the giver in the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. The worship team comes forward. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory, 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 glory.
so many in our home, so many in our family. The needs of touch of the Lord. Will you stand in the gap for those who need to stay? If you personally don't have a need, will you stand in the gap for school mates, classmates, co workers, siblings, parents, children, grandchildren? Nobody want to pray for today? Nobody comes to mind, nobody comes to heart. We're going to continue with the song. The church, I know the Lord is putting people on your mind right now. Uh, if you're on the worship team and you need to come down here and stand in the gap for a classmate that's facing situations, do it. Do it.
Each and every one of us, by the power of your spirit, thank you, Jesus. As we acknowledge you, we acknowledge healing, we acknowledge deliverance, we acknowledge breakthrough in whatever area we may need it. We celebrate you this morning, Lord. We celebrate the finished work of the cross and all that is provided for each and every one of us. We thank you, Lord. And we bless your name. The name that's above every name. The name that's above sickness. The name that's above disease. The name that's above pain and, and uh, dysfunction in Jesus' name. That name is the final word for every situation and for every circumstance. And we give you all the thanks and the praise for it. In Jesus' name. And everybody said praise the Lord. Amen. Give the Lord a hand. Praise God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Praise God. Praise God. I just encourage you, whatever your need was or is, if you've asked for prayer or if you just uh, were asking God to minister to you personally, then now you have to put your faith to work. And that just simply means believing that it is done. And you speak only the word. Amen. Don't, don't fuss with the symptoms and the uh, facts. Go with the truth. And the truth is God's word. Amen. Whatever God has said about the situation, that is the truth. Praise the Lord. So, amen. You just have to, from now on, from this point forward, set a watch over your tongue and speak life to the situation. Amen. Only say what God says about it and you'll get godly results as you, in Jesus' name. Praise God. Amen. Amen. God bless you. you. may be seated. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, worship team. Thank you all for ministering. You were led by the Holy Spirit. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Praise God. Thank the Lord. Amen. Good job, you guys. Everybody, praise God. Thank you all for being sensitive to the Holy Spirit. Thank you, Jesus. Thank the Lord. Amen. The uh, young people, Sunday school kids, you can all be dismissed. Go downstairs. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Praise God. We just let the Holy Ghost continue to minister. Praise God. Thank you, Lord.
You know, I said uh, Wednesday night <clears throat> that uh, the things that we've been uh, studying and, and uh, teaching and preaching on the last few months are not new things. They may be revelation to some simply because it's being said in a different way. But the truth is everything I've been saying has been about us being one with God. You know, whether that's about being the bride of Christ or whether that's about us being conformed to His image. These are all fundamental Christian teachings that have been going on for millennia. And we've all heard them taught from the time we were first coming to church, whatever that, whenever that was. But I think we get into we get to a place where we just we hear it, and it because we've heard those scriptures said in the same way over and over. I've talked about when you know the organization I was in before there was a message that was preached every service. Sheila can say praise the Lord and amen to that. To where you almost become blank. I mean, you know it's coming, and you're not listening for any more revelation. You're not looking for God to really speak to you. You're just saying, here we go again. And it's not that it isn't true. It's just that God wants to speak some things to us in a deeper way. To take, so it isn't, you know, God is a continuous revelation. And it doesn't, all things are new to us. They're not new to Him. That's right. Amen. So when, we, when we're talking the way that we're talking, it's really more about getting our spirits to get stirred up again. So we're not just constantly speaking intellectual truths or teachings that we can just go kind of numb to after a while. So it isn't to be controversial, it isn't to be uh, provocative, none of that isn't what this is about. What this is about is to get us to connect with the Spirit, and that's who we are. Everything that was said here this morning is about God's already here, He's already in us, He's already alive, and we have a tendency to want to look up when we pray or look out there somewhere. He's right here. And if you're born again, if you're a believer, you have Christ in you, the hope of glory. The Spirit of God dwells in you bodily. Amen. And that's the thing that we're trying to connect this mental thing, this mind, the soul. It's translated suke, that's feminine. Doesn't mean anything about sex. It has nothing to do with that. It's just the way, the gender of the word. And the spirit connecting the feminine, the soul, the mind, with the spirit, which is always given in a masculine gender. God is our Father. We know God is not just a man floating around in heaven. He has feminine qualities. We know He's the, uh, the many-breasted one, it says. My daughter can say praise the Lord. He's a sustainer. Amen. <laughs> I just want to draw attention. Uh, he's the sustainer of life, the giver, the giving of life, the nurturer. Amen. So He's not just a, an old bearded guy floating around in heaven. He's way more than that. Yes. And again, it's not male-female in the sexual identity aspect. It's what those two functions are. And in the scripture, that word suke, female, feminine, is the way the soul is always described. Or the way that we think. That is supposed to be married to our spirit, which is always masculine. That's the, that's the uniting. That's the becoming one, amen, with God. It's Christ in it. That's, our spirit's been born again. Amen. It's, not, it's no longer I that live, but now it's Christ that liveth in me. That doesn't mean I don't still have my life and my identity and my stuff, right? But that's where my mind has to be if I'm going to get anything from God. If I'm going to function in who I am in Christ, then I have to have this connection. My mind has to submit we talked about that last week. It isn't about a wife submitting to her husband and being lesser or anything else. It's all an example of our mind, our female, submitting to the male, to the spirit. Okay? Because he keeps telling us over and over in those scriptures that this is a parallel or a parable about Jesus and his bride. About Jesus and the church. 
And we've made it all about the other thing. Not that there doesn't need to be submission on both parts in a, in a marriage, in any relationship for that matter. But that is not the focus. The focus is supposed to be about Jesus and we've made it about us. Exactly. And it's why we don't get the results that God has promised us, amen, through His Word. So I just, I, I just use this analogy. And so it's like when any time we have this spiritual experience, this revelation, if you will, we have to be careful that we don't blind ourselves to the revelation. In other words, to where that revelation stops us from learning something even beyond that revelation. So it's like, this is a, this is a story Mark Twain told, but it's, it's appropriate here. So if we don't do that, we end up being like the cat that sits down on a hot stove. He'll never sit down on a hot stove again. And that's good. But the problem is he'll never sit down on a cold stove either. Because he just thinks stoves are bad. Right? So this, that, that's the point that we're trying to get across here is that we don't want to just get a revelation for the sake of the revelation. We want a revelation to open us up to greater truth. So, amen, I don't want to sit on a hot stove. But if I'm really tired, I may want to sit down on a cold stove if there's one available. If you understand what I'm saying? So we, we can sometimes get so, I don't know, flaky, you know, religious in that way. I'm not talking about spiritual because spiritual is spiritual and that's all good. But we can get to where we're weird to people who are not spiritual. And when we do that, we've lost our ability to minister to them. Because they're just saying weird, just weirdos. You know, we can be as weird as we want with each other because we all get it, right? Yes. You know, weird from, a, from, a, from an outside perspective. But when we're ministering to people who are not of the family, that aren't a part of the bride, we have to deal with them where they are. Praise the Lord. So that's, that's the point. Now, God has done something beautiful here this morning already. That's all done by the Spirit. Was it done by us? It wasn't done by our flesh. It was done by the Spirit of God. It's what God wants to do all the time. Praise the Lord. So, that's the point. Amen. That's, that's just the way we want to do it. Praise God. Otherwise, it's a crapshoot. You don't know. Is God going to move or isn't God? God's going to move every time we allow Him to. Every time we connect this and don't let this be dominant but let our spirit dominate this we come into agreement with God and God can do anything at that point that's what Jesus was talking about when he said I only say what I hear my father say he said I don't let this determine what I'm speaking I let this determine it and that's why we have the Word of God the Word of God is spirit and it's truth God did not promise us miracles every morning he didn't promise us a prophetic word every day. He promised us His Word. Yes. Right. Yes. Amen? And if we'll say what the Word says, we'll get the results of that. Yes. Otherwise, again, like I said, it's, it's a gamble. It's just, you don't know. Praise the Lord. And I only gamble when I eat sushi in an airport. Praise the Lord. I'm not a gambler. Praise God. I don't like to gamble. Hallelujah. But God is good. Amen? Amen. Yes, Fear has no place in any of us. We perfect love casts out fear. And God is love. Perfect love. So there should be no fear. If fear comes, you can just write it down. That is not coming from God. That's coming from the flesh. It's coming from your mind or it's coming from some external force that's affecting the way you think about something. Praise the Lord. So I, you know, I've got an irrational fear of speed bumps. But I'm slowly getting over it. I'm just hoping some, something will stick. You know, if I throw it out there. Not, not the joke, but the... The truth is behind it, okay? Amen. Praise the Lord. We are spirit and soul. Yes, we are. Praise the Lord. And that is to be one. When it becomes one, 
then we are operating as God in the earth. People will see it. We'll experience the results of that. All things are possible. Amen. If you believe, the masculine and the feminine, the spirit and the spirit and the soul come together, becoming one with God, becoming God's revelation, becoming God's image in the earth. Praise the Lord. So that's where I want to start this morning. If we will, uh, Sheila, let's go to Genesis chapter 1 and verse 27. Genesis 1, excuse me, verse 27. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. All right. Revelation 2 and verse 5. Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and I will remove thy candlestick out of this place, except thou repent. Now, you know, we'll get more into the book of Revelation at some point, but not right now. But the thing that's always fascinated me, and I talked about this several years ago, is we recognize the symbolism throughout the Bible. And then somehow, when we get to the book of Revelation, all those symbols become realities. And it's just insane. I mean, the types and everything that we see throughout the Bible, all of a sudden we get to the Revelation and, we're, and we start making everything literal. Yeah. That's for another time. But nevertheless, just for the sake of this particular scripture, the candlestick is Revelation. Look at the temple. When you go back to the temple, it's the light. It's what lights the temple, the inner court. Amen. And that light is supposed to be a type of revelation. It's, a, it's symbolic of revelation. Everything in the temple is symbolic of some other spiritual reality. So that's what we're talking about here. Uh, when I come to, he said, if, 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 you, uh, if you don't remember, remember therefore from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and will remove like, your candlestick, or your revelation. Amen? So the focus here... And these scriptures is to remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen. Amen. Where did they fall from? We read it in the very beginning. God created man in his own image. So that's what he's talking about. This oneness with God, this oneness with God's image is where, may, where we fell from. Yes. Amen. So look at uh, Revelation 2 verse 7. He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith to the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Now, it's not a, by accident, amen, that he uses this. First, he tells us, don't forget, remember from where you fell. And then two verses later, he tells us, if you have an ear to hear what the Spirit is saying, in other words, if you'll, if you'll listen with spiritual ears instead of your natural ears, you're going to find the way to get back to the tree of life, which is in the midst of the garden, or back into paradise. Praise the Lord from where we were when we fell. Yes. Praise the Lord. So while Jesus is challenging us to remember from where we have fallen, he's also declaring to us that we can return to the fruit of the tree of life. Yes. Praise the Lord. Now these two things are connected. And they're connected because they are both related to the garden. They're both related to paradise. They're related to God. Where God's plan and where God's purpose began. Everything that you read from Genesis on is all part of God's plan being unfolded to us. And revealed to us. Jesus being the ultimate revelation of that plan and that purpose. Which is why we have the book of Revelation. It's not a revelation of a bunch of weird stuff that's going to happen at some point in the future. It's a revelation of Jesus Christ. It's the apocalypsis or the revealing of Jesus. Yes. So if we're, starting, if we're looking for flying locusts the size of Volkswagens, we're looking at the wrong thing. Yes. Those are symbols. Those are symbolic of some spiritual activities. If God only knows, all you got to do is turn on the news or read the newspaper. Or as Mike said, look out the end of the parking lot and you'll see junk happening that is demonically inspired as well as things that are happening that are 
spiritually inspired by God, that are by uh, uh, the result of God's influence. Amen? So Jesus is not telling us here to remember where we fell from last week or the last time we sinned. He's encouraging us to remember all the way back to the beginning and what exactly caused the initial fall of humanity. We've made it all about my latest stupid. If I do that, I'll never get anywhere else because I've got too much stupid going on in my life to ever get past it. It's all, it'll always be about me and my latest failure or whatever. I'm supposed to see myself in Him. I'm just supposed to be that connection. That's what that connection is about. Amen? So, this remembrance connects perfectly to what He has promised to give us in the paradise of God. His image. Praise the Lord. God is showing the way back to the garden where we have access to the place where humanity fell from. Back to our original condition. That is called redemption. Yes, it is. Praise the Lord. It's, it's, this is how simple this is. And we, we complicate it with all kinds of stuff. Only because that's what we do when we let this thing dominate. So look, look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 17, Sheila. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. I'll just show you a few uh, parallels here. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. So if anybody that has accepted Christ, that has believed in Jesus, that he died for their sins amen. and rose again, amen. That's all it is. That's all there is to it, being born again. Anybody that believes that is a new creature. Old things are... Now, they may look in the mirror and they look exactly the same. Even the stuff they do and the words that come out of their mouth may be the same. But this is a spiritual reality we're dealing with here. Not a physical representation, but a spiritual truth. So, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Even if they're not new, it's still new. As far as God's concerned. Even though we're rep repeating stuff that is old... We are still new in Christ. Yes. Now, if I can ever get my mind around that, then my spirit will dominate. Yes. And I'll have a lot less issues with those yes. past things. Yes. You understand what I'm saying? Yes. And we all got them. Yep. They're just different. Yep. So that's the reason for this. It isn't so that we can say, oh, well, this person's all screwed up. No, we're all screwed up. Yes. That's the reason why we have to get our mind in tune with our spirit so that we can dominate, so that God can dominate our situations and our circumstances. Not just so that we can lay hands on the sick, but so that we can recover. Because yes. we all need recovery of some kind yes. in some area of our life. Multiple areas maybe. Amen? So here, we, that's it. This is a parallel scripture to Revelation 21, verses 1 through 5. So let's go there. Revelation 21, 1 through 5. Now watch, look at this closely. Revelation 21 and verses 1 through 5. I saw a new heaven and a new earth. The first heaven, remember, new creatures. He that's a believer. Yes. Old things have passed away. Yeah. All things have become new. We're looking for a globe coming down out of the sky or something. I don't know, but that, I'm just saying. I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away. There was no more sea. Remember this, because we're going to touch on some of this stuff. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. And he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. Praise the Lord. So he's saying that all that God is lives in us. No more sorrow, no more pain. The former things have passed away. Behold, I make all things new. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things have passed away. All things 
are becoming new. All right, Revelation 21, verse 1. I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away. And there was no more sea. So the change that takes place in our being one with God will make the earth new. Out of which this temple is made. Are you still with me? Genesis 2 verse 7. He that hath an ear, let him hear. Genesis 2, verse... That's okay. Genesis 2, verse 7. He that hath an ear... Okay. And the Lord God formed man out of what? The dust of the earth. Out of the dust of the ground. And breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And the man became a living soul. Praise God. So, the change that takes place... And our being one with God is what makes the earth new. The earth out of which the temple was made. Us. The result of all that God is living in us breaks the bondage of corruption. The earthly. Are you still with me? Yes. The fact that God and I become one, the fact that all that God is living inside of me, it breaks the bondage of the earth realm, of the natural. Because we are spirit beings. We just happen to be in the earth. We are not of the earth, we are just in the earth. We've been born from above. We're new creatures, right? All right. So, 2 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 52. See, it's really, this is really just about looking at things from the spirit instead of the intellect, instead of the mind. The mind will catch up with it eventually, but only if we let the, if we make the spirit dominate. Otherwise, the mind will dominate and you'll always be in some argument with yourself about well, what does that mean and what's this mean and this denomination believes this and some other denomination believes that and all of this mumbo jumbo that does nothing but confuse and doesn't move us forward at all. In fact, it just binds us and holds us in the place that we are. So the Lord God formed man out of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. All right? 2 Corinthians 15 and verse 52. 1 Corinthians, I'm sorry. 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 52. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. Praise the Lord. So when the last trumpet sounds, that signals that the mystery of God is over. It's finished. Amen? God will be manifested. Christ will be manifested. That mystery of Christ in you, the hope of glory, will be revealed. No more mystery. Praise the Lord. All right. Back up to verse 51. Let's just read verse 51 through 53. So behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In the moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, the dead in Christ, or the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, this mortal must put on immortality. It's what we just read in Genesis, and we also read it in Revelation. Amen. What changes us is when this mystery, amen, comes to an end. When it's no longer a mystery that Christ is in you, that you and God are one, this corruption puts on incorruptible. God dominates the incorruptible one, the one who cannot be corrupted. We are corrupt because we're earthly, we're of the earth. I'm talking about the soul, the, the mental way we operate. 
But God is incorruptible. He's eternal. He is perfect. Yes. He never changes. He never ages. He never dies. That's right. Incorruptible. Right. That's what happens yes. when this is no longer a mystery. Yes. Right. Praise the Lord. The mystery comes to an end. The mortal, the soul, puts on immortality. Yes. The spirit. When the mortal and the spirit become one, the spirit dominates. Yes. And we are no longer that old thing. We are a new creature in Christ. And the mystery is no longer a mystery because we are aware. We are, have a revelation of who we are in Christ. And that, my friend, will bring about a revival, if that's what you want to call it, like there has never been. It will bring a book of Acts experience like that will overshadow the book of Acts experience. That's what God is pointing us to. Not to another Brownsville, not to another Toronto, not to another Billy Sunday or anybody else. Not that any of that is bad or any of that is good or irrelevant or anything. I'm not saying any of that. I'm saying those were all good things. But that is not what he's pointing us to. Not a bigger one, not a better one. He's talking about the end of an age, the end of a way of thinking, the end of a way of being, amen, where the church actually rises up and no longer is mysteriously trying to figure out who they are, but actually becomes identified with God and the result is the supernatural yes. Yes. amen and what we experienced here this morning and I don't again I get I know where we are okay so I'm, I'm good with this but see that won't even ever even happen again you'll be walking in healing Yes. You'll be walking in divine health. You'll be walking in prosperity. You'll be, and we won't be spending all of our time struggling with these things because our true identity now dominates. We're not trying to get our head around this anymore. Our spirit is telling us that's who you are in Christ. It's not a mystery anymore. You don't have to try to figure it out every time you get attacked. Jesus. Yes. Praise the Lord. So when Christ is revealed in us, and through us, it says in, the, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump. Twinkling of an eye. And I thought about this. Is it this? No. Twinkling is speaking to light. Twinkle, twinkle, little star. How I wonder what you are up above the world so high. Like a diamond in the sky. Yes. Twinkle is light. That's what we're talking about here. Not how fast you can blink. No. If you just, I mean, we're just talking, just use language. Just use what verbiage is. In the twinkling of an eye. It's not just in the moment of time that passes by. Look, at, I'll show you. Matthew 6, verse 22. The light of the body is the eye. Yes, it is. If therefore thine eye be single, whole body will be full of light. Yes. Your eye is focused, it's light, and your whole body then is filled with revelation. Yes. Jesus Christ, the revelation yes. of Jesus. Amen. Look at Acts 26 and verse 18. To open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light, from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. Our eye becomes single when we see ourselves only as the new man in Christ. Yes. Yes. One with him. Right. When we see ourselves only in Christ, our vision has become single. Yes. In the twinkling of an eye, yes. you'll be changed. Yes. Yes. Praise the Lord. I'm not waiting for some pie in the sky. 
When my vision is single, it's light. When I see only Christ and me as one, I'm changed. This corrupt puts on incorruption. All of a sudden, it's not mysterious anymore. I'm totally in tune with who I am in God. Praise the Lord. I don't, I don't need any thing to hype me. It just is what it is. Yeah. James chapter 1, verses 6 through 8. James 1, 6 through 8. And then you'll realize all of your laboring to be godly was a big waste of time. Because you can't do it. What you can do is get your eye focused on your oneness with Him. Be single-minded and you'll be filled with revelation. It won't be mysterious. It won't be a mystery anymore. There won't be questions. It'll just be what it is. Let him ask in faith, not, nothing wavering. For he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. This is so wild. And, for let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. Single-minded man is one with God. Double-minded man is where most of us are most of the time, which is why we don't get what it is we think we're, we've got coming. We're not in, experiencing the inheritance because we're thinking human thoughts and trying to force that human way into a divine thing, and it can't work that way. It always becomes even more mysterious. I don't know why this is going on. I mean, it just doesn't make sense. I know what God says. I know what the Word says, but why, you know? Praise the Lord. All right, James 1, verse 6. Let him ask in faith, nothing wavering, for he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. All right, look at Revelation 21 and verse 1. I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. When we become one, no more sea. If our eye is single, Jesus and us are one. No more wavering like a wave of the sea because the sea is no more. That's what we're talking about in Revelation. A church that has found her identity people that have become one with God. Single in vision. No more double-minded. No more tossed around like the wave of the sea because there is no sea. There's no longer us seeing two men, but we see only one new man, the new creature in Christ. Old things have passed away. New heaven, new earth. We only see the new man. Then our eye has become single and our whole body is full of light. When Jesus was on the Mount of Transfiguration, filled with light. It was a revelation of God in him. We even have our little things with angelic beings and their halos. The divine presence of God. It isn't the angel that isn't divine. But it's God's presence. It's God's anointing, God's sending of that person, God's activity, if you will. All right, first, back to 1 Corinthians 15, verse 52 and 53. 1 Corinthians 15, 52 and 53. See, that's why I was talking Wednesday night, and that's what I'm saying is that's why your mind has got to be renewed to the Word of God. You cannot... Just take some scripture that you heard 10 years ago and then confess it and think that, well, now I should have the answer. No, you got to believe it. You, you, this has to dominate the way you think. It has to have precedence over the natural way of thinking in order for it to work the way it's supposed to. 
the reason Jesus had such anointing and such power as a man, he wasn't functioning as God on this earth, he was functioning as a man filled with the Spirit of God, wasn't he? That's why we are just like him. The only difference is the words that I say are not always the words that my father says. I say a lot of crap that just comes out of my own head or out of my experience or out of somebody else's experience because I'm not disciplined which is what a disciple is. Not beating myself up because I said a cuss word or not beating myself up because I, you know, had a bad thought. No, that's not the issue. The issue is if I'm going to say something, I want to say, it's concerning whatever's going on in my life, I want to say what God has said. That's where my power is. That's where my authority is. So in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump, Trumpet shall sound, and this dead will be raised incorruptible. We shall be changed, for this corruptible must put on incorruption. This mortal must put on immortality. Praise the Lord. So I believe in a visible return of Jesus. I'm not denying that. I'm just saying like every other scripture in the Bible, there's a surface message that's being told, and then there is a spiritual truth beneath that that we're missing, that we're settling for something on the surface, always projecting things to the future. Well, one of these days, he's coming back, and I'll be changed. No, he's already come. He's already come to his temple. We're supposed to be changed. There'll become a future coming, but I, that shouldn't be my concern. That'll just take care of itself. This is the one I should be concerned about because I have some influence over it. I said last time, or sometime, Everything from the cross on is subjective and objective. That doesn't mean we make things happen. It means we respond to the things that God has done in the way that we believe. So it's objective and subjective. God just did some stuff. Amen. But we have a response to those things that he did. And that is to believe and to speak in agreement with it. Praise the Lord. So. I believe that Jesus is coming again. I believe that there'll be a physical appearing of Jesus. But first, he's going to become visible in his people. Praise the Lord. Before he comes back, somebody is going to be a visible appearing of God. Somebody is going to make it back to the garden. Somebody is going to be back to that image that this, incor this corruptible is going to put on incorruption and somebody is going to identify with their original condition, their oneness with God. And that somebody will be the church. Now, I'm not saying people that don't get there won't go to heaven. I'm just saying heaven won't come here until we do. And everything in heaven is already settled. Everything in that other realm is already determined. It's here that it's not. And it's what we say and what we do that determines how much of heaven invades this area. Whatever we bind on earth is bound in heaven. Whatever we loose on earth is loose in heaven. That's up to us. That's what we have to do. If we want to see this, we keep waiting for another revival. We keep waiting for another move of some kind. When God has done all the move and He's going to do, He's waiting on us. If there's anything stagnant about this, it's us, not God. Praise the Lord. So, there's going to be an appearing in us. Amen. His image. His bride. His dwelling place. Call it whatever you want to. All of those are synonymous with just God's image. Yeah. We call it, we, Jesus gave us all sorts of different ways of saying the very same thing. And that's what I'm doing. It's not a new thing. I'm just saying it in a different way. And that's what he was doing over and over. Telling the same story, just using a different way of telling it. Because he knew the attention span of most audiences is about like that. What was I talking about? Do you know what I mean? That's, not, that's no reflection on you. I'm just saying. And the younger you get, the worse. The millennials, you know, they call them. I mean, they've known nothing but smartphones and iPads and iPads and, you know, the computers and instant everything. If you don't reach them quickly, you won't reach them at all. Corruptible. Puts on incorruption. That's the appearing. In the twinkling of an eye. All right. A couple more scriptures and we'll quit. Haggai. Uh, chapter 2, verses 3 through 9. 
Haggai 2, verses 3 through 9. Who is left among you that saw this house in her first glory? This house. A house. An earth house. How do you see it now? Is it not in your eyes in comparison as if as nothing? Yet now be strong, O Zerubbabel. Remember Zerubbabel? He's the one that spoke to the mountain. Grace, grace. Right? Saith the Lord, be strong, O Joshua, son of Josedek, the high priest, to be strong, all ye people of the land, saith the Lord, and work, for I am with you, saith the Lord of hosts, according to the word that I convey, co covenanted with you when you came out of Egypt. So my spirit remaineth among you, fear ye not. For thus saith the Lord of hosts, yet once is a little while, and I will shake the heavens and the earth and the sea and the dry land. And I will shake all nations, and the desire of all nations shall come, and I will fill this house with glory, saith the Lord of hosts. The silver is mine, the gold is mine, saith the Lord of hosts. The glory of this latter house yes, shall be greater than that of the former house, saith the Lord of hosts. And in this place will I give peace, saith yes. the Lord of hosts. Yes. Praise the Lord. So Haggai said the latter house is going to be greater than that of the former house. Yes. When it was finished, the glory of the Lord filled the house so no man could stand to minister. Yeah. What? Is that not what we're talking about? When we come one with God, the glory fills us, the, the, the revelation of God fills us, and this will be greater than that. Yes. It'll be greater. Not only are we redeemed, but we are redeemed to something even better than what the original was. Yes. Praise the Lord. Wow. Genesis chapter 1, verse 27. I mean, why, I don't know why we can't believe it. We can believe Adam just took some dirt and breathed in it, and it became a living soul. Man, I mean, he can do anything he wants to, and he can do it with this dirt box here, this pile. Amen? He can do it with us. He wants to do it with us. He did it before, and he wants to do it again. He wants to do it even bigger and better, amen, than it was in the original. Because God never just repeats himself. He's always improving. It's always better. It's always more. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. Soul and spirit he created them. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. Verse 31. And God saw everything that he had made and behold it was very good. And the evening and the morning were the sixth day, sixth day of the day of man. And we got the 666 stuff, six stuff. We're all freaking out about the next one. You know, is it Trump? Was it Obama? Is it Hitler? Is it somebody else? Praise the Lord. Praise God. Revelation chapter 2, verse 5. Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen. We just read. And repent, or change your mind, and do the first works. What's the first works? Be one. Stay, stay in that oneness. Don't go looking for the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Just stay in the tree of life. Jesus. Right? Stay connected to the tree, the vine. And we automatically produce fruit. Repent and do the first works or I'll come unto thee quickly and I'll remove thy candlestick out of this place except thou repent. I'll remove your revelation. What does it say? It talks about it in the, in the New Testament. I think it's in one of the Gospels, maybe in several of them, where it says, uh, if, if to whom little, you have little and you don't use it, you lose it. Yeah. That's what he's saying here. Yeah. Yes. I'll, I'll remove the revelation you got. If you're not willing to go forward. See, that, that's, that's the history of Christianity. Yes. Calvinism. That's what I believe. There's my revelation. And don't try to budge me out of it. Right. I'm not going for water baptism or something, you know. So the Baptists come along. they got to have a revelation. So they come up with water baptism. Baptists. Then there's a revelation of... Receiving the baptism of the Holy Spirit and speaking in tongues. That's of the devil, they said. I'm not, I'm not budging off of this revelation. This was grandma's revelation. This was dad, mom's revelation. This is my revelation. So God has to find somebody else. 
step out and believe the next revelation. That's what I talked about here a couple weeks ago. You know, we've got this idea that, okay, well, the veil is rent in twain, and, and now we have this access to God. But most of us are still standing in the holy place, peeking in and not going in. There's more than just Pentecost. Just because Pentecost is more than somebody who came before us, but that's what happens. We get stuck in a revelation, unwilling for God to move us any forward. So whatever revelation we got, we end up with nothing. Because just check out some older denominations, and I'm not naming names, I'm not talking about Baptists, you know, I'm just saying, who have absolutely nothing now except a social program. Why? Because they weren't willing to move forward in any other revelation. They ended up losing actually the revelation that started them in the first place. Yes. Yep. I'm not trying to spook you. I'm saying, I'm not saying they're not going to heaven. I'm just saying they're not moving any further, amen, into this revelation or this twinkling of an eye where we become one with God. And that's what changes the last days. Yes. Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen, repent and do the first works, or else I'll come unto you quickly and will remove thy candlestick out of this place, except you repent and except you change your mind. Verse 7. He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith to the churches. To him that overcometh, amen, to him, right, that... that Finds out where they were, from where they have fallen, and changes their mind. To them, I'll give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. That's what we're talking about. And we can say it in any multitude of ways, but it's the truth, no matter how you say it. Now. It's on us. We can continue to whine. <laughs> Amen. We can continue to look for excuses. Or we can remember where we came from. And make that the priority. So in the midst of all my failures, I still have an identity. And in the twinkling of an eye, the moment I can get my eye fixed on that truth, on that identity of who I really am, this new creature in Christ, yes. old things will pass away. Yes. And we're not judging in the meantime. No. We're renewing our mind. We're getting this soul to come into agreement with the Spirit to where we really become a husband and wife, a bride, where the Spirit of Christ in me, the husband, amen, marries this right here. But this right here has got to come into agreement with who I am spiritually for that thing to produce anything, for there to be any productivity, for there to be any fruit. Are you all with me here? Amen? If we just use the natural analogy. There won't be any of that ecstasy. There won't be any of that woo, honeymoon that will never end. It won't happen. It'll be the drudgery of forever dating somebody who doesn't figure you out and you can't figure them out. Right. It'll be like that longest date you've ever been on. Yeah. Where you just keep looking at your watch and trying to figure out some way out of this without making a fool out of yourself. Yes. Amen. It'll be that one that you never want to end. Yeah. Are you guys with me? Yes. But you've got to, we've got to make this the priority. Not religion. Not how good we're behaving. Not, you know, whether we're doing this thing or that thing or what, following this ritual or that ritual. That stuff will all take care of itself if we would make the priority the priority. Remember where we came from. Make that the focus. And everything changes. This corruptible becomes incorruptible. Praise the Lord. I think it's a great, it's a great, uh, you know, kind of parallel because we've already seen this as, you know, Jesus is coming. We're going to see him in the sky in the twinkling of an eye. Bang, we're changed. We're something else. Now, I do think that'll happen. But in the meantime, it's supposed to already be happening here. 
But we, we, we do what we do. We project everything. We make it some future event that maybe I'll live long enough for this. doesn't matter. I can have that experience right here and right now. I don't need to wait till I'm 110 if that's how long he wants to tarry. I can have that reality right now. And the future will take care of itself. Praise God. So... Let's not be like the cat set on the hot stove and never set on another hot stove, but never set on a cold one either. Praise the Lord. It's good to learn, but only if it continues to move us forward. It's not enough to just have a bunch of information. It's supposed to push us forward. It's supposed to move us to the next thing that God's trying to do in our life, whoever we are and whatever we are. We've made it all about us being good, being really good, being better, being nice, being this, being that. Of course, we all want to do those things, but that is not the criteria that God's looking for. He's just looking for a person, a vessel, who will make themselves available, who will see themselves the way He has defined us. Perfect, spotless, without wrinkle. See, you know, as well as I do, it's impossible. You can't do that in the natural. Because we see all of our flaws. We see all of others' flaws. And that's why Paul was saying, I see Christ and Him crucified. That's all I see. If we're seeing anything else, it's a good indication that our eye is not single. And if I see it in somebody else, you can bet your sweet self that I'm seeing it in me too. That's why I'm seeing it in them. You know, it's just, that's the facts. That's the way it is. So you sooner or later, we got to let go and let God, the old cliche, but it's truth, nevertheless. Amen? So I'm going to close with this. Remember from where you've fallen. Repent. Amen? Because there's a garden waiting. Praise the Lord. Perfection, peace, love, joy in the Holy Ghost. Amen. Give the Lord a hand clap this morning. Praise God. Praise God. Amen. God bless all of you. Appreciate your patience this morning. Go be somebody. Praise the Lord. Be who you really are. In Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you all. Dismissed.